All right, troops, strong and conditioned, live and direct from Glasgow, Scotland. And tonight, we've had to bring him back, <laughs> one of my most popular guests, the one and only Jared Miller. Jared, how are you tonight, brother? Doing absolutely fantastic. How about you, Lee? Yeah, yeah, uh, fine, buddy, fine, buddy. You were telling me there that you have a slight cold, which would probably obliterate most people, however... <laughs> A man of your physical standing, it's uh, obviously just a, a minor inconvenience. So uh, how have you been dealing with that in the last week? Uh, I mean, yeah, it's it's virus that, that hit me. Uh, the biggest thing, and anyone who's watching my channel can see, I'm, I'm hacking up a lung in the middle of my workouts. Uh, so I was doing a 40-minute uh, EMOM the other day uh, with five burpee chins with the weighted vest. And Basically, it was about 30 seconds of burpee chins, 30 seconds of coughing, 30 seconds of burpee chins, 30 seconds of coughing. So, you know, time, timed out well. I, I got my rest intervals all set up now. So, so what's your mindset when it comes to training when you are under the weather? It takes quite a bit of under the weatherness for me to really, like, put the kibosh on things. And even then, I don't ever completely stop being physical uh steve pulsanella had this idea of paleo rehab which i've talked about before and it's uh the notion that if the body gets ill or injured and you treat it with rest the body learns a condition response of if i get hurt i get rest and the body likes rest so the body will just keep getting hurt and you get these nagging little injuries that just suck but if the body gets hurt and you just hammer the crap out of it because it got hurt it quickly learns, one, I need to heal because the demand isn't going to stop. And two, I need to stop getting hurt because whenever I get hurt, this happens. So I should just perform well. So even when I'm sick, I still do something. I do push-ups and bodyweight squats. I, I try to walk out in the sunlight as much as I can just to get the circadian rhythm going. But I, I I won't you know do something completely bonkers. I won't use that day in particular to test my limits, but I'll still make sure that I'm doing something. So what would it take to make you take an actual break from training? Or what has happened in the past where you've thought, right, I'm taking a week off? Uh, a week off, never. Uh, I can't <laughs> even. So keep in mind, there's a video of me two days after my ACL reconstruction where I'm doing dips and shins and uh, uh, band pull-aparts. Uh, and really the only reason it wasn't the day after was because my wife was with me all day that day. And I knew she would not let me do that, but she eventually had to go to work. And uh, when that happened, I, I snuck in the garage and got my dips and chins in. Uh, I've, okay? I've, I've come out of the hospital after severe dehydration from gastroenteritis and hit uh, squats that day. I, I hit a squat PR uh, two hours after having a wisdom tooth taken out. Um, I don't know. It's So right, if, we, if we were to look at it in the context of a professional athlete who tears or damages their ACL, they would be told to rest because mm -hmm. the, their finances depend exactly. on these limbs to a certain degree, whereas mm -hmm. a guy like you bucks the trend in that respect. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Do you think that you are, like, this is, to, there's a neurotic element to this behaviour to a certain degree? Like, do you have to like temper the voices in your head yeah training i mean i've had periods where it was like that these days i, I train because i want to and I, I still don't like training i don't like being physical but i i greatly enjoy what it does for me to the point that i want to do it but yeah i mean that was that whole three week period i just went through where everything was viking themed where i just did the things that like appealed to me that was that was a fun bit of training uh, regarding the uh, the professional athlete versus the amateur thing, part of it is absolutely, like you said, their livelihood depends on their physicality, so they got to play that long game. Whereas for me, this is just a thing I do. And yeah. and in turn, I can also, I can periodize as needed. Uh, uh, injuries are forced periodization, which I think is another Steve Poulsenella-ism. If I get hurt, that's my time just to work on other variables and other qualities. Whereas a professional football player, they have to be good at football. That's their job. So if they hurt their ACL and they got to cut and run, they need to cut and run. They can't switch to figure skating or or pick up baseball or something like that. Whereas if I blow out something new and strong, man, I'm like, oh, maybe I'll get into throwing. Maybe I'll get into grip work now. Maybe maybe I'll pick up the rower. Maybe I'll just go for walks. I can I can just play around. Yeah. 
So one thing that sticks out in my mind is when you were doing your cycle of super squats mm-hmm. and I think you <laughs> tore a hamstring mm-hmm. or mm-hmm. damaged your hamstring in yep. some capacity when you were doing this. Yep. However, you still completed the program. Mm-hmm. Because you document your training so publicly, do you think that there is a pressure on you to complete these programs because you have built up that reputation. You know, uh, this is something Dan John talks about, the idea of, um, of a, geez, what, I forget his term now, uh, uh, some, not, not forced community, but like a, a generated community. He's got an actual term for it. And uh, it's this idea of bringing people in together and, and uh, you know, creating that response. And so he also, also got uh, what he calls the, uh, the Alpo diet, the Alpo dog food diet. And it's a similar idea where we we put it on the line out there. We tell people, hey, everyone, I'm going to do X in Y time frame. And if I don't get it done in that time, I'm going to eat a can of Alpo dog food, which uh, he got from Tony Robbins, actually, the uh, motivational speaker. There, there's some element to that. There are things that I'll have in my head for quite a while, but I'll wait until I'm ready to commit to it before I announce it. And then now that it's out in the open, I'll do it. But at the same time, it's it's all on me. I, I still don't quite fully grasp that people are watching me. Uh, I've, I've got a blog that's been online for over 10 years now. It's got 3 million plus views. I've had people tell me they read my blog in high school and now they're adults with jobs, which of course makes me feel old. Uh, and that is a big influence on them. And it's still sort of mind blowing to me. So it, I, I exist semi aware that I'm out there publicly, but for the most part, it's still just me in my garage doing these things. If no one was watching, I'd still do them just for me. Uh, the, uh, the super squats thing in particular, I just, I was just so pissed off because I'd finally committed to super squats and I got RSV in between, which, which is just basically like a bad virus, uh, in between workout one and workout two. And then on workout five, I tore my hamstring and I'm like, I, you know, I finally was ready after 10, 15 really like years of having not run this program and then like this is going to happen no screw this so i i just i was all it was the the end was already decided and that's that's something i've written about before too about like how to get through like a tough set or a tough workout is if you approach it saying to yourself look it's already happened i just got to endure it now it's much simpler than thinking oh you know i gotta here comes rep 15 here comes rep 16 like every single time i knew the end was already there i was just living my way through it yeah, it always fascinates me that you you seem to have these hacks that mm. enable you to overcome these potential obstacles. And one that always stood out to me was I remember a gentleman commenting about why your music was so loud mm-hmm. and you told him it was to mask the sound or that your knee makes, mm-hmm. which I, I found fascinating. <laughs> yep. Yep, it's true. It's, it's Rice Krispies, it's Snap Crackle Pops. <laughs> it's barbaric. It's absolutely barbaric. And that's obviously reflected in your writing because when you do write, and you always make a lot of reference to like Norse mythology mm-hmm. and what have you, which is very masculine and mm-hmm. it's, 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 it's barbaric. Mm-hmm. So that leads me on to like my next question, which is... is is your selection of workouts you, you don't program for yourself like i've never seen you write a program and put it out there this is my program you always take tried and tested programs okay Rach, it's tried and tested but they're never cookie cutter programs as well now i'll get on to that in a minute but mm-hmm. can you explain like why do you why do do you never program for yourself when it's obvious you've got the knowledge and the capacity to do so? So I, I will say never is not the right word. I have programmed for myself quite a bit. Uh, just recently, I, I did those three weeks that were just all those Viking workouts that I just came up with. Uh, and when I have a strongman competition up, I'll do my programming for that. Uh, but the, the big thing is that I, I know what works for me to play to my strengths. And so when I need to do that, that's what I do. So when a strongman competition is coming up, that's not the time to get strong. I should have been getting strong before the competition so that when the competition comes, I can show up strong. So once that, once it's announced that I'm eight, 12 weeks out, I do my programming. I'm like, all right, cool. I know how to, I know how to peak for this. I know how to get better. 
but I don't know how to make myself stronger. If, if I did, you know, that'd be great. But instead I do have to rely on other people who are different than me. And the big thing is that we will, well, even if we think we're masochists, even if we think that we are the greatest thing ever when it comes to getting stronger, we're just naturally going to incline towards those things we like doing or are good at. That's just human nature. We, we don't like to exist in a state of disharmony. We like to be constantly in a state where everything's doing just fine. Well, to get bigger, better, stronger, faster, we need that necessary drive of disharmony. We need something to interrupt us and force us to adapt and change and grow and get stronger. And so if we look to someone else's programs, they tend to do that because someone else is going to write something that, excuse me, you wouldn't think to, to do or you wouldn't want to do. Uh, the very first time I opened up John Anderson's deep water program, I, I pretty much laughed. I'm like, yeah, that's never going to happen. Close the book and let it marinate in my head for about a solid year before I finally said, all right, well, maybe, maybe that'll happen. And then I ran it and yeah, true to form, like it was transformational, completely changed me, made me yeah. incredibly big, strong. And you know, the same story with super squats, building the monolith. 531, uh, BBB, all those programs were things that I wasn't doing that I needed to do. Yeah, right. So can we go back a little bit to the actual deep water program? Sure, sure. What, what was it about deep water that like, like caused that reaction initially prior to embarking upon that journey? Well, so the first thing you do is you open it up and the beginner program day one says 10 by 10 squats. <laughs> And you're like, okay, that's a laugh. No. And then if you make it through that part, it says, all right, rest four minutes between sets. Next week, same weight, three minutes between sets. And then next time, uh, same weight, two minutes between sets. And you just look at that. You're like, are you insane? Like, that's 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 ridiculous demand. No one could do that. And then, oh, by the way, after you're done, three by 10 lunges. Oh, and by the way, after you're done, some ab work. Oh, and by the way, after you're done, uh, do some deadlift uh, form technique. It, it just, it's just relentless. It's brutal. Uh, yeah. But in turn, uh, it's it that's that's what we need. And yeah, we can't run them all the time. But, you know, for a six week, 12 week shakeup, you run something like that, you change. Yeah. So, so can you can you describe the changes that you experienced when you did deep water? So, I mean, the one thing was uh, uh, for uh, someone who grew up as a fat kid, it was amazing being in such a constantly recovering state that I literally could not eat enough. Uh, I, I had an hour lunch break and it was like being on the clock. I'm like, I'm just going to eat for a solid hour and hope to God that I eat enough food during this lunch break that I can meet the training demand. But it also just it, it shows you what you are capable of if you try. Because you look at the program and you think that it's insane, but somehow if you do eat enough and you will yourself through it, you get through it. Uh, just go, going from starting with 10 by 10 squats with four minutes rest in between and that feeling awful to shaving that in half by the end of the program is just ridiculous. And then if you move on to intermediate and now you take those 10 sets and cut them down to eight and still get 100 reps in, you're, you're a changed human. Yeah. So what were the, the, the physical changes that you noticed? Did you notice any considerable muscle being developed? Oh, absolutely. No, I got, I got the biggest I'd ever been in my life. Uh, I, I, I remember we went to the zoo and I was wearing a tank top and my wife took a photo and showed it to me. And like for the first time in my life, I had what I'd considered big arms. <laughs> and, it, you know, it's just one of those things that, you know, you want when you're a high school kid and and, you, you know, I, I, I was too cool for curls for the longest time. It wasn't doing them and, and, you know, finally brought them back. But, yeah, that changed, uh, you know, just just my, my whole body. I mean, I, I think I accidentally got up to like 210 pounds. Once again, not even <laughs> thinking the, about the body weight, just eating to recover from the brutality of the program. And I was just swelling up and, you know, just just hitting ridiculous numbers and, and you, you're you're fit, too, because those 10 by 10 squats with two minutes rest in between, 10 by 10 deadlifts, 10 by 10 cleans, like your heart is pumping. Uh, you know, I spent a lot of my rest times on the on my back, on my garage floor, just gasping, waiting until I could finally regather myself in those two minutes to do the next set. Yeah. So how do you select the weights for deep water? Is it a percentage of a one rep max or do you just find a way and then just build on that? Uh, John recommends a percentage of your 10 rep max. And it's a uh, 70% of your 10 rep max for the 10 by 10 work. 
Uh, the rest of it is, yeah, you just need to figure out uh, a comfortable weight. People get all hung up on like the bench press weights and the, the assistance weights. And it's just like, that's, that's just standard bodybuilding stuff. You should just be able to pick a weight there. But for the 10 by 10 stuff, yeah, it's 70% of your 10 rep max. So I, is the progressive overload factor factored in through the recovery period mm -hmm. as opposed to a progression of weight? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. You keep the weight fixed the whole time. But you're shaving off rest periods, which I loved because and I and I still love the program because if your joints and connective tissues are beat up, it's a great way to still challenge yourself and give them some rest. I actually feel a lot more refreshed after 12 weeks of deep water than I do on a lot of other programs. Now, mentally, I'm just broken by the time it's done and I need a break from that. Uh, but as far as my body goes, no, it feels great because the weight hasn't moved up the whole time. I've just been shaving rest periods down. So my joints, limbs, ligaments, they all feel just healthy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what fascinates me about the deep water program and a lot of the other programs that you have done mm -hmm. is that they fly in the face of the, the current mentality that you see with regards to muscle growth, which is... Mm -hmm three minutes recovery between sets targeting muscles and low volume but high intensity mm -hmm. and they speak about doing too much work and it's going the, the, the effects will be pointless after so many sets mm -hmm. so how, how does a program like this when you perform it like i'll cause you to balloon in size yeah. so to speak when it's when it's almost fly, it's being, I'm not what to say disproven, but the current chat suggests that such a program is pointless in some respects. Mm -hmm. Well, and so that's, that's an interesting discussion point there because we're in the, the realm of optimal and everyone who's chasing optimal runs into this issue. So there, there's two things I want to address here. And one is that if you do what everyone else is doing, you get the results that everyone else is getting. That should seem obvious, but it's mind blowing to people. They don't understand this idea that that the average is average. And if your pursuit is to be different than average, doing what the average person is doing is not how you achieve different from average. Now, you won't necessarily achieve better than average if you are doing different, but you will achieve different than average. Better is one form, worse is another, but at least you'll be different if you do something different than what the average person is doing. So if everyone is training one way for hypertrophy, well, look at what everyone looks like. They they don't look good. You go to an average gym and people look like average gym goers. So if you want to look different than average, you have to do something different than average. But beyond that, when we discuss optimal sets, optimal reps, yeah, it's optimal, which is great. But the people that achieve greater than average results are doing things beyond optimal because there's a point of... Uh, of um, not uh not negative return what what's the it's it's an economic term i'm blanking on it right now but basically like you're you're not getting as much in out of your investment as you did initially or regressive returns someone out there is smarter than me but <laughs> either way uh diminishing that's the term I'm looking for diminishing returns a lot of diminishing returns well that's cool but guess what a diminishing return is still a return and that's what people don't understand it's like look if you get 80 percent of your results in the first three sets and every set after that is only getting you 1.5% results. Well, cool, but that means if I do 12 sets, I got that much more percentage than you did with your three sets. And yeah, your three sets were more optimal. They had the greatest return on investment, but I still got more by doing more. And that will eventually add up. You know, the guy who's making $80 versus the guy that's making $80 and 47 cents, eventually those 47 cents will tick up to big numbers over a long enough time. So people people need to understand that if you're in the gym anyways, you might as well put in that little bit of extra and you might as well eat that little bit of extra and gain that little bit of extra because that little bit of extra over a long enough time adds up. The whole effort time consistency thing, you do this for 20 years, those small diminishing returns returned. <laughs> So how long would an average deep water session take you when when you are at the like the, the end of the the program? Well, and that's what's really funny about the program is no matter where you are, it takes the same amount of time. <laughs> uh, and that's because uh, the the lower body days, um, if you initially do it and you're not in great shape, probably take you about 100 minutes, so an hour, 40 minutes. 
But even if you get to the two minute rest, I say make sure to factor in 20 minutes after you're done of laying on your back sweating. So even even though you shaved off all that time in the rest periods, you still need it at the end just to die. Uh, so, yeah, the, the lower body days were always the longest. So it always put them on the weekends. But the upper body days, they can last anywhere from from 40 to 60 minutes. So the the interesting thing about deep water as well is it comes with a, a, a there's a nutritional angle mm -hmm, to mm -hmm. deep water, and it's it, it's it's low carb or zero carb, depending how you go about it. Did that heavily influence your outlook, or was like the way you ate prior to that, like was was it already low carb yeah. zero carb in that respect? Absolutely, absolutely, and that's what I, that's what I loved about it. Basically, like John Anderson, when I read the book, it it effectively gave me permission. Is what it boiled down to, because prior to reading his book, I was doing five three one. Jim Wendler, fantastic coach, he's a wizard. He can write a program, you follow it, it gets you strong. But it just wasn't appealing to that psychotic part of me that just wanted to push limits and try to find where the 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 boundaries were. And and same thing, you know, he had a very uh, balanced nutritional plan, which works great for athletes. But I was low carb at that point. I just I, I liked eating meat. I liked eating fat. I didn't like eating carbs. And suddenly I read this book by this guy who was a professional level strongman who had won strongman competitions, moved on to become a professional wrestler, moved on to become a professional bodybuilder. And he said, hey, push your limits as hard as you possibly can and eat a low carb diet. And I'm like, holy cow. Yes. Someone I agree with. Someone who agrees with me. I've been given permission. Let's go. But. Nowadays, John John still knows how to train hard, but he's kind of like a nutrition coach with the training plan rather than the other way around. His emphasis is so heavily on nutrition, and it still is the, the low carb is part of it, but you got to coincide it with also high quality what you do eat. Because the first time I ran it, I was definitely doing like the the dirty deep water. I was using a lot of fast food and you know just throwing away the buns and and. Uh, you know, just just not the cleanest sources of food. But when I started switching to things like grass fed beef, pasture raised eggs, grass fed dairy, like that that brought it to the the even higher next level of next level. Yeah, yeah. So so how did you feel when you started to upgrade to those more nutritious foods? Oh, substantially like grass... better. Yeah, 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 yeah. How did that affect your performance in the gym? Um performance in the gym i don't think i saw much of a difference i mean realistically when i was in my 20s i was doing the the dave tate try to gain weight uh, uh jm blakely approach where i was eating little debbies and and snack cakes and and all the fast food and i was smashing weights it's it's never the performance in the gym that really gets all that impacted because you know that's an hour or so of, of training and you've seen like olympic level athletes that do their best off chicken nuggets and and things like that but it was life outside of the gym where I really saw the difference. I didn't just feel like I was a constant ball of grease. I didn't feel like I was heavily weighed down. I felt I felt light. Uh, I felt cognizant. I felt ready. I felt just just healthy. And you know, there was just a certain mental uh, reassurance when you know that what you're putting in your body is good quality nutrition. You're not you're not playing Russian roulette every time you put the spoon in your mouth. Yeah. So once you had completed deep water. Mm -hmm. Did you find yourself with that notion that you started to prefer the more challenge style workouts as opposed to like a cookie cutter, bodybuilding, powerlifting style program? Those programs that take you to the, the limit instead so, of something. That's, sorry. No, no, go ahead. Instead of something where it's just like progressive overload, double progression. So I'll say I, I always preferred them prior to deep water. It's just deep water gave me the permission to do them is ultimately what it boiled down to. Up until that point, I, I definitely felt like I was made to feel wrong to want it because everything I read was balance, 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 uh, you know, a progressive overload, slow and steady, et cetera, et cetera. And then I read deep water and did deep water. And I mean, I did super squats well before that. And that was also a great challenge workout too. I really needed to have read that book a few times. I wish I did because going back to reread it, they lay it out just fine. Like six weeks, super squats, six weeks, balance, six weeks, super squats, just keep rotating it. And that's, that's a great progression right there. And with deep water, it's the same way. I'm like, look, 
I can go back to 531. 531 works. And and I love to this day 531 whenever I can't think of what else to do. It's just the perfect, hey, here, here's a plan. Just go with this plan. But now I knew that I had it in me that when I needed these workouts, they were there and I could do them. And I wasn't wrong to do them. It wasn't because th- th- there was almost this mentality that pushing too hard is not only not a good idea, it's the wrong idea. And you're working against yourself by doing that. And yeah. uh, there's, there's something to be said, even if physically you gain nothing from doing deep water, if somehow you go from zero to zero doing deep water, the mental changes cannot be discounted. You are a changed human when that program is done. And and now you can tackle just about anything knowing that you have that in you. Yeah. So would you recommend that like people who do training, who do the weights, that they throw in a challenge workout every once in a while? I'm always hesitant to make recommendations. Uh, the big thing I can say is I can only speak for myself because I've only ever been myself. I'm not a coach. I don't coach other athletes, but you know, the, the big thing I look at people is ask them, what, what do you have to lose? Especially if you have been stalling forever doing the same thing, that's the greatest place to be in the world because that means you can literally do anything other than what you're doing and you at least get different results. And again, different is part of the process of better. So yeah, if you've, if you've just been running the same program over and over again and it's not getting you any results anymore, do deep water, do super squats, do something like that and just shake it up and just see what happens. Yeah. Okay, so what, name me three challenge-style workout routines that you would recommend someone perform at some point. So I think every trainee, irrespective of goals, should run super squats. Uh, and they should just do the full six weeks and they should do, if they possibly can, if their body tolerates it, the gallon of milk a day with it and just really just get in on it and and live that life because there are so many lessons to learn from super squats. You learn how to obsess about your training. You learn how to get a handle on your nutrition. You learn how to push yourself. Uh, I throw deep water in there as well. And again, what I love about both of those programs is their books that come with the program that lay everything out for you. And it tells you exactly what to do. And same thing with deep water. When you run deep water, run the nutrition that comes with it, see how your body responds. I've seen a lot of people that were, were poo-pooing the low carbs and tried it out. They're like, Hey, this actually works. It's like, yeah, the, the body will find a way to adapt. It's pretty cool. Yeah. And then uh, the third one uh, I'll throw in this plug uh, again. I just, I just finished my two weeks of the famine phase again is uh, Jamie Lewis's feast famine and ferocity approach. Uh, it's, it's just absolutely uh, a great a protocol. And again, it's a diet and a program put together, which I love. And especially since it's a phasic approach to both two weeks of famine and four weeks of feast, and they'll, they'll both challenge you in different ways. Yeah. Do you know, you, you've created a thought and I've just had a light bulb moment. The, the three programs that you've mentioned, mm-hmm. Particularly the first two, they come with a story. Mm-hmm. Like a conventional p- program that you'll get online is just a program. It's just mm-hmm. a set of exercises with rep schemes. Whereas <clears throat> super squats, deep water, deep water in particular, they come with a story. You, oh, yeah. you, you learn about awesome. the background of the creator. They also mm-hmm. come in a nutritional package as well. It's not just mm-hmm. a program. There's a, it's like an all-encompassing experience, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. which kind of makes sense in that challenge work workout context. And I'm not familiar with the Valhalla program, but what I have uh, obviously come across recently is this amazing concept that you have introduced yourself where you have started to create a story Mm -hmm. around the workout and the workout reflects the story, which I, when I first read that, it blew my mind because it was so creative and I like to read as well. So it resonates with me in that respect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what, what is it about that like concept that, that, that sucks you in Jared? So that, that was just fun. That was absolutely fun. And so I, I did steal that from Jamie Lewis in the Feast, Famine, Ferocity program. When you read the book, he talks about 
how human beings have existed in periods of feast and famine historically. It's only recently that we've been in this period of superabundance. And that's what motivated his workouts was during periods of famine. That would be the campaigning season. That's when Vikings would go raiding. They'd be rowing boats and they'd be uh, doing battle and they'd be doing a lot of high endurance work. And then they'd come home and they would feast and celebrate. At that point, it was feats of strengths and festivals and lots of food and high strength, low endurance work. And so it's just a very fun way to approach the training. And I read that. I'm like, you know, we can work with that. And so I'm, here I am wearing my Dungeons and Dragons shirt, uh, proudly displaying my my nerd. Uh, <laughs> and yeah, absolutely. I, I, I love uh, reading about Norse mythology. I love the Conan the Barbarian Sumerian story, which I think my next run is going to be based off of that. But it, I woke up one morning and I was supposed to do the next workout in the feast program. I just finished famine. And I just plain didn't want to do it. I just woke up. I'm like, that's just not what I want to do today. And like, all right, well, what do I want to do today? So I did what I wanted to do that day. And I decided I was going to make a story out of it because I'm like, it's still the feast. I just finished the famine. It was two weeks down. I was going to start eating. I'm like, well, then let's make this a real deal Viking story then. And each workout I did was uh, it was very easy to steal from there. Uh, the first one, I, I basically took the Calsu workout from CrossFit and made it Vikingized. I used uh, Viking thrusters instead of traditional thrusters. Uh, and then I did a uh, Viking burpees, which kind of kind of worked out. I was still sort of figuring that one out. But it was just it was just a blast. Uh, yeah, and, and people are like, oh, you're finally enjoying your training. I'm like, no, watch the video. I'm suffering. Like I am <laughs> clearly in misery during the training. There are multiple moments where you'll actually hear me say, bleep, I hate this. <laughs> like Because I, I get mad at myself for coming up with these workouts because they suck. And then I do them, but they they transform me. And then throughout it, in my mind, I'm like, all right, here we go. I'm you know I'm celebrating the memory of the Vikings. I'm, I'm doing X, Y, and Z. And I'm just enjoying myself. And then I, I just kept writing the story, like a campfire story. I'm like, all right, well, now what happens to the Vikings? Well, you know, now they're going to go on a raid. Oh, okay, cool. Well, what's a raid? That's loading stuff. All right, cool. I got a keg. Let's load up the keg. Let's put that in the the, the ship, which was my truck. <laughs> and you know, just I just had a blast. And so the big thing is, you know, I'm 37 years old. Uh, I've been playing Magic the Gathering and Dungeons the Dragons since middle school. I was a nerd. I've had food thrown on me. I've had milk dumped on my head. I've I've been <laughs> shoved around. And you know, I'm finally old enough and big enough and strong enough that I just don't care. Like I can just I can just have fun. And I can, I, and people can read this thing and they'll say, oh, that's so cringy. And I'm like, you know what? I don't care. I'm, I'm having fun. I'm having the most fun I've had in my life. And if you're too cool to have fun with Vikings and Dungeons and Dragons, well, then you're not invited to my birthday party. Yeah, it's, it's, it's almost like a, a, a real life role-playing game in that respect people call it live action role-playing yeah yeah, and yeah. It's a level, that's a level of nerddom that's just super up there but you know what they're having fun and yeah and if, People can have fun as long as they're not hurting other people. I don't care. Yeah, because because you literally are leveling up. Mm -hmm. uh, oh when, yeah, absolutely. When you perform the workouts, like your your strength bar, mm -hmm. dexterity. Yeah, I don't know, know about you're... intelligence, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, sometimes sometimes it works to have that go the other way, just to not think about how stupid these workouts are. Yeah, yeah. You you obviously play the barba <coughs> the barbarian class mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in these games. And it's really refreshing to me because, and this is when I go into my old man shouts at Cloud Face. Yeah, uh -huh. I'm, I'm, and I was speaking about this with Faz Lifts recently and something along these lines. And it's to me like lifting is becoming very generic mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. nowadays. The, it's, it's a constant procession of the same yep. vapid images, particularly on short form content dominant social media mm -hmm. where you get a, a guy and he's he's got anabolic lighting yeah his veins are popping out and he's just posing and turning around and it's just this this horrible narcissism mm -hmm. but it's and as with narcissism it's completely empty mm -hmm. it, it makes you feel hollowed out when you look at it oh yeah Whereas on the flip side, when you speak about this, it's very rich. It's, 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 it's what they're looking for. 
it's 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 just full of a joy to a certain degree. It's fun. Absolutely, absolutely. It's the complete flip side of the coin, and it it's something that's needed in lifting because no one's telling those stories anymore. No one's mm-hmm. writing those books with the stories like the, the keys to progression or mm-hmm. uh, like even Mass Made Simple. When Dan John oh, yeah. uh, wrote that, that was a story. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And human beings always react to stories. It's, Absolutely. it's, it's part of the soul. Mm-hmm. So your programs are speaking to the soul in that respect. A hundred percent. No, you, you've nailed it. You know, every, everyone wants to link me scientific studies and I just don't read them. And, you know, sorry for those people who thought you were really bringing me like the pile of gold, but I'm like, I don't, I don't <laughs> care. I genuinely do not care what science has to say about this. And, and the big thing I bring up is it's like, again, the optimal thing. If the difference between optimal outcome and suboptimal is a 2% gain, I don't care. If it's a 5% gain, I don't care. If it's 10% gain, I still don't care because I, I, I'm i just going to do this for the long haul and I'm going to get the results I want. And if 10% means literally one pound more of muscle per 10 pounds of muscle gain, who cares? I would rather train the way I wanted to train the whole time I trained and be three pounds of muscle less than you after 30 years than, than do something that I hate the whole time just to achieve this result that I will eventually lose. I mean, this none, none of this is forever. It's all ephemeral. So we're just we're just doing the things that we want to do when we want to do them. So we might as well have some fun while we do it. Yeah, because <clears throat> to go back to the challenge workouts, they are gruesome, mm-hmm. but they in themselves are a journey as well. When mm-hmm. you get to the end, oh whereas goodness, yes. if you look if you look at a conventional hypertrophy program nowadays. They're very static. Mm-hmm. It's targeting a muscle, and it's really fucking boring. Yeah, yeah. And I know that's because I tried it myself. Uh-huh. And I would go to the gym and I would like try to do two sets close to failure or failure, as everyone's speaking about nowadays. And I was just finding it really dull because ultimately, mm-hmm. what I know is happening is that I'm pushing a weight twelve inches. A to B, it's 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 just it's it's boring movement. Whereas mm-hmm. I know if I'm going to have to do ten sets of ten squats, I am going to be going through mental anguish mm-hmm. for that 10, 20 minute period, and I need to come out the other end. So there's a sense of adventure which appeals to that that male spirit in some mm-hmm. respects. Hundred percent. So, uh, it, to me, it's always been something that's captivated me in that respect. Okay, so, t- to move on to the nutritional side of things, because we touched upon this in the last podcast, but I, I wanted to get an update because I know you've had a a 180 shift with regards to your nutrition. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And you spoke about a weight coming off your shoulders. Oh my goodness, yep. How, how are you getting on with that at this current moment in time? It's it's just incredible. Uh, I I have just reached a point of just just happiness and contentness and and simplicity with how I eat. Uh, and it's it's effectively when I do eat, it's carnivore. Um, it's it's meat or animal based. Uh, so I'll, I'll eat uh, eggs, egg whites, uh, uh, some some amount of dairy, not much, but primarily just meat. Uh, I still uh, and I'm still blending this with the velocity diet. And Jamie Lewis's Apex Predator diet, so I still use uh, protein shakes, and uh, it's it, it it blends incredibly well, uh, and it's just so high speed, low drag. I'm just not constantly thinking about food. I'm not preoccupied. I'm not planning, and I, and I'm not hungry. I'm I'm eating until I'm not hungry, and then I wait until I'm hungry, and then I eat again. It's just so simple, and such a yeah. such a great place to be in. So how how do you start your day now? Like, what, what, what's, what's the, I mean, I, I remember it, you were training fasted. Mm-hmm. Sorry, my dog's going crazy here. You're fine. You're, I remember you were training fasted. Do you still use that uh, protocol or do you? Like... It, it, you know, it will depend on how people define it because I, I've i taken to having a protein shake in the middle of the night. And that's, uh, I wake up to pee. I'm, I'm 37 and I'm usually pretty well hydrated. 
So at some point in the middle of the night, usually around midnight, I have to get up to pee, at which time I have a shake that's got one scoop of protein in it and one raw egg with some salt. Uh, I drink that after I'm done. So then I get up around four to train. So yeah, am I fasted? Am I fed? I'm not too sure. But I don't eat once I wake up. Uh, I, I just start hitting the gym. Um, I'm When I'm in the feast protocol of the feast and famine, I... I tried to eat like some egg whites beforehand, but honestly, I, I'm fine training fasted. It doesn't really affect me. Uh, I lift weights for about an hour. And then if I have time for a little bit of conditioning, I'll do like a five to 10 minute conditioning session. Really just depends on, on how my day is going that day. Uh, after that point, uh, I uh, get the kid ready for school. I have breakfast then. And breakfast is usually a, it's, it's protein mixed with egg whites heated up to sort of resemble oatmeal. And that's really just for the social aspect of sitting and eating a meal with my kid. Because I, I do want my kid to observe dad sitting down at the table, eating, drinking coffee, and having that experience. I don't want her to know dad is just this total meathead that just lives off shakes. You know, it's I, I can do that when she's gone. But while she's still here, I'm just going to I'm going to do my best to, to be there and, and be dad. Uh, Okay, wait. So let's. You, you said something there that caught my attention. Let's backtrack on this. Sure, sure. You, there's two phases. There's the famine phase and there's the the, the feasting phase. Uh huh. Which kind of ties in with the whole Viking mindset in that yeah, respect. Yeah, like, if yeah, you were yeah. going on a raid, you wouldn't be eating anything until you completed the raid, which is fascinating in itself. So let's talk about the famine side of things. How okay. how does that work, Jared? Yep. Yeah. So I, and I'll say flat out, I have not followed the full on famine protocol that Jamie has laid out. And once again, that's just because I, I, I want to be a good nutritional model for my kid and following that just wouldn't work because what Jamie recommends is a protein sparing modified fast. That's just protein shakes. You just have protein shakes for two weeks uh, and you uh, take your body weight. Uh, you get that amount of grams of protein. And that's it. So you're looking at like an 800 calorie diet for a lot of people for two weeks. Excuse me. But I mean, that's that's going to work. That'll definitely strip off any fat that you have. Uh, I, what I do is I'll still do the protein shakes and I'll use egg whites as well to supplement because there's no there's no carbs or fat. They're just protein. I don't count uh, calories or macros, but I just go by scoop. I have two scoop shakes and I'll effectively use a protein sparing modified fast until either my evening meal, which is dinner, or if my uh, wife is at work and I can visit her, I'll have a lunch with her, but then I'll make sure it's a lunch of just protein. So I, I'm big on egg whites and chicken breast. Uh, you can mix them in. You can make a, a very large meal out of egg whites and chicken breast and still have it be pretty much like pure protein and very few calories. So I'll have that. And then at dinner, uh, we'll eat what we eat for dinner. Uh, I can still keep it carnivore for the most part. Uh, if not carnivore, it's, it's pretty much keto ish, uh, you know, trace vegetables, lots of meat, lots of protein, and I'll try to get my animal fats in at that point, uh, but still sparingly. And I follow this for two weeks and after two weeks, I'm just absolutely peeled. Uh, I hit an all time low body weight, of 168.6 pounds at the end of this, which I was 201 pounds at the end of super squats. So and I always point out to people throughout the Velocity Diet, throughout the Apex Predator, throughout all this, I had zero intention of losing weight, which means I've never been hungry. I've just been following the protocol that's been laid out for me. And out of nowhere, I dropped 31 pounds. So it's it's been rather remarkable just how much just crap was in my body that got shedded out when I just cut it down <laughs> to streamline and, and, and did that. But in turn, just like you read in uh, Mass Made Simple, like I, I am primed to grow at this point to, to hit such a low body weight at the end of those two weeks. Uh, I'm ready. Uh, now, the big thing is, is I include. So I need to interject, Jared. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go, ahead, go ahead. I may have missed. Did you lose that amount of weight in two weeks? No, no, no. God, no. God, no. Hey, OK, I was worried uh, there for a minute. So, so I ended super squats on the 2nd of March. Right. OK. And that, that's when I was 201 pounds. Uh, okay. And for the most part, I, I, I didn't care to weigh myself for quite a while, but eventually I started doing it more just as a scientific uh, curiosity because I was like, I'm, I'm getting kind of lean. This is this is getting kind of weird. And so that's uh, that's where I did that. But no, I did, I did not lose 31 pounds in two weeks. Yeah. So how do you feel when you're just like living? Right? The one that interests me the most is how much money do you save? 
when you're just consuming protein shakes? Uh, so my wife does all the finances. I'll just say that flat <laughs> out. Uh, if if she got hit by a bus tomorrow, I'd have no much money, uh, no idea how much money I have or where it is or what it does. Okay, right. So she, does she like pay for the food as well? Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, <laughs> my my credit cards are like a gift card. Uh, I'll, I'll ask wife, "Hey, can I buy this?" And she'll be like, "Yeah, no, we're fine." I'm like, "Okay, great, thanks." <laughs> Oh, that's strange. If the roles were reversed, there'd, there'd be a name for that. <laughs> <laughs> so now I, let's I'm, go. I'm more than content to be a trophy husband, believe me. <laughs> so let's let's go into the the feasting side of things. The, so the before, exciting side. Before before we do, I do I need to throw in a caveat here. So because I'm I'm using more of the apex predator approach, that means that once a week I engage in what Jamie calls a rampage meal which I've posted the, the uh, photos of these before, but it's a three hour window of basically unrestricted eating. And this is where I get carbs in. Uh, and, and the truth is I don't care to eat carbohydrates. I really like animal protein. I really like eating animals, but I've noticed that if I skip this rampage meal, I do suffer effects. And that includes my weight loss will stall. My fat loss will stall. Uh, just say nothing of gym performance doesn't get as good. I mean, car- carbohydrates are magic. I mean, we developed them and, and the world changed, but they're especially magical when you don't consume them regularly because then they're such a foreign entity that your body eats it and goes, holy crap, what is this? This is amazing. So if you go a solid week of protein shakes and then for three hours you eat a bunch of French toast and then you go another solid week, well, the day after that French toast binge, you're going to hit some squat PRs and you're going to look peeled. Because your body is just going to soak up every single gram of glycogen and throw a bunch of water at it. And your muscles are going to swell up and expand. Like it's, I'll see the changes through the day. The big thing is like my veins come out of nowhere and I look like a a roadmap of spider veins. Uh, (laughs) And I'll, I'll be that way for like a day or two, just absolutely shredded out of my mind. So it's. It's 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 uh, worth keeping there, but otherwise uh, the the famine is just the the protein shakes and very limited amount of food. Right. Okay. So how <clears> like like I'm I'm, I'm a bit, my head's spinning a bit here. Right. How does that work? Is it like is it like the the, the famine concept, but with a big cheat meal thrown in? Is that exactly? The... Exactly. So and if you look at it, Jamie Lewis wrote a diet before all this called the Apex Predator Diet. Yeah. And that's heavily what this is modified and based off of. And and in the Apex Predator Diet, there's a, a weekly rampage meal. That the uh, the idea is it's a cyclical keto. So you're 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 in a state of ketosis, and then you kind of intentionally throw yourself out of it just so that you can get back into it. So that your your body can make those necessary adaptations there, yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's it's just one big three hour window to eat a bunch of carbohydrates and 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 in turn too, like and, and this pisses people off because everyone wants to say thermodynamics, thermodynamics. But since I don't care about science, I can just think whatever I want. And one of those things is that if you stay at a constant state of calories, your body adapts to that constant state, which means you no longer get the intended effect of fat loss or weight gain for that matter, your body just adapts. But if you're waving the calories and if one day you throw this big cheat meal at it, it readjusts its baseline and says, oh, I guess there's food around now. We can start being less efficient because an inefficient metabolism is one that will burn more calories, which is great if you want to eat more food. You know, we, we're able to adapt to starvation, but it's ideally not to do that because otherwise you're at 800 calories a day and still not losing fat. And what are you going to do at that point? Yeah, I, I did the calorie counting thing and it worked, but I, I I eventually felt that the I think calorie counting is a vital tool for people at a certain stage in their fitness journey. However, I think it can only be used for a certain period of time before it starts to like seep into the mental side of things, mm. family life, when it just becomes a stress that is unnecessary. So it's obviously a very liberating approach you take, but you circumvent it with extremely hard training. Most people who are calorie counting aren't training hard, and I don't mean that bad. I don't mean that to denigrate their efforts, but it's it, it, it seems to be the case. Well, it was a know, case. Go ahead. Pardon? Go ahead. It was a case for me, like I, I would think, like I could get away with eating 
in a fun style, so to speak, but it, it, it never worked because I wasn't training hard enough. It was only when I upped to training intensity after I discovered your log that, that I noticed that things started to change even while I was eating a bit of rubbish here and there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you have to wonder if it's a sort of chicken and egg sort of thing there. Uh, because I, yeah, I've counted calories once in my life. That was in 2004 when I started my training log way back in the day. And I was like, this is cumbersome. I hate this. I'm not going to do this. But if you, one of the things Jamie talks about with the feast is that there's a, there's a mental feedback loop where when you're eating a lot of food, you think to yourself, I better train hard because like I'm eating all this goddamn food and I, I should put it to use. Otherwise, it's just going to not work for me. Whereas okay. if you're counting calories, just like you say, you, you kind of think to yourself, well, no, I, I hit the goal. I hit the mark. I, I don't really need to train all that hard because I, I have the assurance that I ate the exact amount I need to eat. When you're, when you're yeah. wild westing it, you kind of have to play the Kentucky windage a little bit there. Yeah, it's quite interesting that you say that because I see a lot of personal trainers on Instagram in particular. And they will speak about that through a toxic lens when they will tell people that don't feel you have to over-exercise the next day if you have a pizza the night before. Mm -hmm. But when you are eating in such a manner of, of which you are, then the mindset changes where you think, Right, I've had the rampage meal, so I'm going to make this count. Because then, then you start to look at it from a performance point of view. Mm -hmm. Where it's like, this is going to fuel. Like, I've been surviving on minimal intake. And I've feasted, so now I can go to town. Mm -hmm. And it's going to make my training fun. As opposed to that neurotic mindset where you're just exercising to burn calories. Exactly, exactly. So let's move on to conditioning because that's the one thing that that you're big for, particularly mm -hmm. when you read Reddit. It's, it's one thing you promote. And your whole pr mode of attack when it comes to conditioning is through chaos. Yes. It's yes. Un it's, and for you, that's strange. It it's, it's lacks planning in some mm -hmm. respects. It's like mm -hmm. you, you just think, I'm going to go with it. I'll, I'll, I'll do this today. I'll do that today. Whereas the other side of things is seems to be meticulously planned because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, you're, you're writing fucking stories with your workouts now. Mm -hmm. You can't get any more planned than that. <laughs> Whereas the conditioning side is the complete opposite. It's mm -hmm. chaotic. Mm -hmm. Why why does this work for you? Because that seems to fly in the face of conventional training where everything should be structured. So I'm super huge on duality. And so if you think about it, that's perfect right there. You have some chaos in your life and you have some control in your life. And with chaos and control together, you have balance and you have harmony. You have too much chaos, you have a chaotic life. You have too much control, you have a controlled life. So you need that necessary balancing act there. And in the training world, we call that periodization da -da! it's crazy there it was or waiting for us this whole time but it, it, and you know it's too easy to critique but the the western mentality has always been about maximize virtue minimize vice that's what judeo-christianity is built around that's what so much of our founding principles are based around but eastern philosophy has always been about finding that balance finding that harmony recognizing that these forces they're not conflictory they're complementary they coexist together to create balance to create harmony to make it so that we are harmonious and achieving our best results so if your training is controlled you need that chaos somewhere and that chaos can come in the form of conditioning if you want controlled conditioning that's fine and just have some chaotic strength training then to go with it but have some way to have these forces balance uh, but the other thing too is with conditioning especially coming from a strongman background, you can't just be good at one thing. If you are, you're just basically bad at a lot of things. So instead, with chaos, you develop the ability to be rapidly adaptable because life is chaotic. And adaptability is a demand response to a chaotic existence. Yeah. it's, it's, it's One thing that always fascinated me was that you, you seemed to take tried and tested conditioning circuits like a Fran or a, a mm. Grace, and add more to the mix yep, yep. to make it even more brutal. Because these workouts 
our workouts for mm -hmm. most people they would do oh. that and that would be then done for the day whereas mm -hmm. it became to the point where a grace a grace for you was like something you did between toilet breaks or something <laughs> like that yep yep i, I definitely had uh I, I mean, I was able to get it done in two minutes and some seconds at one point. And yeah, it was, I would tell the wife, hey, I'll be right back. I'm going to go do a workout. I go in the garage for three minutes, come back, be like, all right, that was great. Thanks. Yeah. It's, it's, it's also interesting when you, you, you talk about how you hate training. And mm. when you say you hate training, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming, I can safely assume you hate the actual training when it's taking place itself. Yes, exactly. But would it also be safe to assume that the part you love the most is the, the bit before training when you are creating the session that you plan to take part in that day? There we go. I was about to say, because like the immediate part beforehand, no. Uh, I, I actually set a one minute timer so that I can feel miserable about myself and feel sorry for myself. Because I know if I don't set that timer, I'll spend about 40 minutes going, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. If I said the minute timer, the timer runs out. I'm like, all right, let's go work out. But yeah. yeah, I mean, when when my brain is left to idle, I come up with workouts or I come up with recipes or something. But I'm, my, my brain always defaults to how can we become better? How can we become stronger? And, to, and then the worst part is, is I don't control this. This is my mind idling. So it will come up with an idea and I'll go, oh, God damn, that's so stupid. Why did I think that? Uh, that's that's how I did the 10k swing challenge in seven days. Just I thought about it I'm like, wait, if I did an hour a day and I and I did the math, I'm like, oh, why did I do the math on this? Now I now now it's achievable. Now I can do it and just just little things like that. But no, I mean I I, I have to laugh at myself at one point for these things. Yeah, to to go back to what I said earlier, I think it's because you put yourself out there that, that gives you that extra impetus to complete these things, which is something that I found to be the case uh, for myself when I started my YouTube channel. I, when I was like doing an hour-long burpee session, within five minutes, I, I knew I'd made a really a seriously bad idea, <laughs> but I knew the camera was on me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so i just had to carry on and, and do you feel that's like something that spurs you on because at the end of the day jared you're motivating a lot of people there's a lot of people that do look up to you and you know that it excites me that that happens i still in my mind i'm still just a guy in his garage just lifting weights uh yeah. the, the recording of full workouts is a new thing for me it's it's a little bit cumbersome but people seem to be responding to it. So I'm like, all right, well, I guess I'll do it. And I, I will say the one thing it does is it keeps me from passing gas so much throughout the workout like I used <laughs> to do. So now that now that I know the camera's on me, I'm not going to be doing that. Although really when I switched the diet, that also stopped too. And um, you know, like I, I, I can't say the same for me because I, <laughs> I, I'll, I'll just pass gas. In fact, I think in one of my videos, someone has actually time stamped a moment <laughs> when I quite clearly passed gas. It just came up randomly a few months ago. And, but the, the, that's the beauty of raw training with yep. no gimmicks. You, you yep, just yep. need to be there what's and all. And, and I it, absolutely, I think you're, you're spot on there because too many people just see the highlight reel and they just assume everyone's hitting PRs every time they're in the gym. But it's nice to see the the failures and also just the rep work. Just that, hey, here here's the unsexy part where they're just getting in the work and just getting it done and just making it happen because that's the majority of the training. You know, that, that was the big thing like with West Side Barbell, everyone fixated on the max effort and the dynamic effort. And that was 20% of the workout. The other 80% was just bodybuilding and no one did that part. And then they wondered why the program didn't work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's It, it sucks people in. But mm -hmm. there's a danger, I think, of these style of workouts where people start to live vicariously through you and mm -hmm. you are performing the workout for them. Mm -hmm. They will never begin to work out. They'll just get into watching your workouts and some, mm -hmm. like there's some cathartic element to that. Well, and you're just doing the work for them. <laughs> yep, so yep. It, it, there's that weird vibe that I get sometimes. Like when like, I get comments on my page and I, I think people are just watching me work out. Mm hmm. It's like well, I'm doing it for them. Yep. Well, well, when I when I ate that five pound cheeseburger in 30 minutes, I got the most response I'd ever seen in my life. So, you know, pe people like to watch weird things. They'll live vicariously through you. And yeah, you'll get some kind of weird, creepy comments as a result, too. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's funny you bring that up because <laughs> one of your most popular videos recently was the rant that you had. Mm hmm. 
mm-hmm. which uh, obviously it was had something that we had spoken about before because I, I, I think sometimes that you have got more to offer in that sphere. Mm-hmm. And I think the world has to hear the things you need to say. And I think I was kind of, I felt good because I think my point was proven because of the feedback that that video received. Absolutely. And is that something you plan to do in the future to to increase the the Jared Miller brand? Chaos is the plan. <laughs> okay. Well, listen, Jared, it's been very nice talking to you, as it always is. I'm going to have to wrap this up because... Yeah, no problem, Lee. Family life. However, don't go up when I, I, I press stop on the record and, button, mate. Just and, there. and before you do it, it came to me while we were talking. I just intentional community was the the phrase Dan John has. Intentional right, okay, community. Okay. So I had I had to get that out there before I I let it go into the ether. Well, hopefully we can we can speak to Dan at some point about that. That'd be who, phenomenal. Knows, but, who knows what the future may bring? Absolutely. But once again, as per usual. Would you like to tell the viewer where they can find you? Yeah, uh, if you want to reach out to me, uh, look me up on my blog, Mythical Strength. If you Google Mythical Strength, you'll find me. Uh, my YouTube channel is Emavas, E-M-E-V-A-S. It's the word spell, or it's the phrase, save me, spelled backward. Uh, I'm on uh, Reddit as Mythical Strength. Uh, I'm on T Nation as The Punisher. Uh, it's spelled 2007 leet speak style so it's t3 h p w n i s h e r and of course you know reach out to lee he can point you in my direction too okay listen jared always a joy hopefully come back on again at some point and take it easy my pal you too lee